Welcome to the New Books Network. Confounding, exhilarating, and contagious. Emotions matter, and so does applying emotional intelligence. Welcome to Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight, the podcast where emotions rule. Whatever the topic, how do hearts and minds collide? Find out with your host, a college professor turned globetrotting EQ entrepreneur. His mission? Each week, Dan joins prominent authors in decoding how emotions drive outcomes and make people tick. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for the 24th episode of my podcast, Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. The series appears here on the New Books Network, which has as its motto, sharing knowledge so people can thrive. Today's topic is how to promote peace in the streets. With me is Thomas Apt. He is the author of Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. The publisher is Basic Books. Thomas teaches, studies, and writes about the use of evidence-informed approaches to reduce urban violence. He is a senior fellow with the Council on Criminal Justice in Washington, D.C. Prior to the Council, he served as a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy and Law Schools. Before that, he held leadership positions in the New York Governor's Office and the U.S. Department of Justice. His work has been featured in major media outlets, including The Atlantic, The Economist, Foreign Affairs, The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, CNN, MSNBC, PBS, and National Public Radio. Thomas, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be with you, Dan. Thank you so much for being here. It's a very important topic, and I hope we can cover a lot of ground here in the half hour. First up, why don't you kind of orient readers and give them a top-line overview of the book? Sure. Uh, I wrote uh, Bleeding Out to tell people uh, about urban violence and to talk about the seriousness of urban violence, the gravitas of it, and to convince the general public that everyone has a stake in reducing urban violence. But in addition to that, I wanted to sort of counter some of the pessimism or fatalism because the good news about urban violence is that it is, it is preventable. And that in fact, there are proven solutions uh, readily available to reduce urban violence that don't break the budget, that don't require new laws, uh, and don't even require massive uh, governmental reform. So if we want to have peace in the streets, we can have it. Okay. Well, I very much want to move to the feasible solutions. But before we get there, I just want to help give people a feel for this topic that you are so much informed on. You have a comment in the boat in the book, a, a remarkably strong statement. You said, a single homicide causes more human suffering on average than any other individual act of wrongdoing. Can you maybe just elaborate on that comment? Because I think that will establish the stakes of this conversation. Sure. I believe, and I think many people would agree, that homicide or murder is the single worst thing that someone can do to another person. And that's backed up by the fact that uh, murder is universally condemned uh, across all societies. Uh, it is uh, it is universally placed at sort of the top of the hierarchy of criminal offenses. Uh, and it's also empirically demonstrated through uh, many, many different studies. The costs of crime, both direct and indirect, are, uh, are remarkable. Uh, you know, the costs of a uh, low-level, um, nonviolent misdemeanor offense might be a few thousand dollars. But the total cost to society uh, of a single homicide is estimated by many credible studies to be in excess of $10 million per homicide. Which is just an amazing statistic. There are a lot of amazing statistics in this book. So I assume we're talking here, obviously, there's the individual involved, there's family, there's the community, I mean, that the ripple tides here are incredibly strong. Is there maybe, I mean, that is a really gripping statistic. Is there one or two of the other many statistics in the book that you'd like to uh, offer up to listeners, again, to help establish the stakes of what's involved here? Sure. I think it's, I think one of the things that's important for people to understand is that 
uh, homicide, particularly urban homicide, is concentrated among a remarkably small group of people and in a remarkably small number of places. So in uh, every American city, uh, less than 1% of the city's population, a tiny fraction of 1% of the city's population, uh, is going to be responsible for uh, 50, 60, 70% of all shootings and killings. The same is true for the city's geography. Geography: Three, four, five percent of city blocks will generate 50, 60, 70 percent of the most serious crime and violence. And so uh, urban homicide and urban violence is far more concentrated than people understand, which means that if you can target it, you can uh, make real progress. But as I said, the costs of urban violence are spread far and wide. Uh, among us in society. Obviously, the direct victims, their friends and families pay most dearly, and we should never forget that. But everyone pays for urban violence. They pay through it through decreased property values, increased uh, insurance premiums, uh, higher taxes, and all other types of things. And so it's very important to understand that this is an issue that impacts us all. Okay, well, I, I I like that dichotomy between it is concentrated, but it is holistically pervasive in its impact. So what you just brought up, those statistics on the concentration, I think sets us up nicely to go into beginning to uh, address the issue of how this can be addressed. So you mentioned three things, people, places, and things. I think each of them merits its own opportunity for you to explain it to us more fully. So let's start with the people part. I mean, you talk about three different kinds of shooters, would-be shooters, someday shooters, and bona fide shooters. Uh, do you want to walk us through each of those three different categories? Sure. So uh, in the book, I identify uh, evidence-based solutions uh, for urban violence, as you said, across people, places, and things. People-based strategies, place-based strategies, and really not thing-based strategies, but behavior-based strategies. In terms of the people who are uh, creating uh, or responsible for the disproportionate share of urban violence, both as perpetrators and as victims, um, you know, I spoke to uh, literally dozens of people who had firsthand experience with uh, street violence, uh, former gang members, for, former shooters, uh, cops who were parts of gang units, mothers who had lost children, faith-based leaders, um, in order to sort of marry up uh, the world of research with the real lives of people who had experienced uh, violence. And you know, those categories of uh, someday sh shooters, would-be shooters, and bona fide shooters came out of both the research and those conversations. Someday shooters are, uh, are children and adolescents who are already displaying, displaying warning signs for uh, delinquency and aggression and other things. They're the, the children that and adolescents who people know um, sort of are demonstrating sort of troubling signs. And they are the, they are the uh, young people that if we intervene with evidence-based programs, we won't have to respond to them later with arrests and incarceration. Uh, so that's very important. The would-be shooters are typically the young men and adults who are really at the highest risk for violence, again, both as perpetrators and as victims. But for whom intervention is still possible. They may be actively involved in a gang. They may be involved in high-risk behavior. They may be carrying a gun for, for protection. But if they are offered the right set of incentives, uh, they can be turned around and uh, they, they can voluntarily uh, move away uh, from this high-risk uh, behavior. And then lastly, there is an exceedingly, exceedingly small sliver of people. And I think it's very important to sort of uh, reinforce that this is a very, very small group of people. But there are a group of people 
who are persistent violent offenders and who refuse assistance, refuse any sort of uh, positive intervention, and uh, are deeply, deeply dangerous uh, to themselves and others. And those are what we call the bona fide shooters. And, uh, and those people are really, we do need to separate those people from society and protect society from these individuals. And it seemed to me from the book, you know, in these various gangs, for instance, when we were speaking about gangs, that it seemed like it was maybe two, three, four. There was there was like a core, really hardened core that were the most dangerous ones. And even the other fellow gang members could be a bit frightened of them because they were indeed these bona fide shooters. Is that correct? Or am I recalling, recalling it not quite from my reading? No, that's right. I mean, from, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of rigorous research in this area. But anecdotally, speaking to lots and lots of people who have, uh, you know, um, uh, enforced the law against gangs, uh, participated in gangs and groups and cliques, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, if you've got a if you've got a group of young men, um, you know, say you've got a hundred young men who are um, part of this uh, this group, you know the vast majority of those young men are actually not at the highest risk for violence. And in any particular gang, you've got a lot of people who like to go to the parties. You've got a lot of people who like to sell the weed. You've got other people who are related. Um, but those are not necessarily people who are at the highest risk just because they affiliate with the gang of those a hundred people, maybe five or 10 are what are, what are known sort of within uh, violence uh, reduction circles as shooters or potential shooters. They are, when that group has some type of conflict, the small number of young men, and it's almost always young men, who will reliably uh, pick up the gun and uh, and sort of carry out the, the mission of the group, which is often violent retaliation for previous uh, violent offenses. And then within that subsection of those 100, there might be one or two young men who are not just capable of violence, but really seem to enjoy it and seem to seek it out. And those young men are viewed with deep fear by their fellow group members and the community. Uh, and in fact, I had one former gang member tell me that a lot of those uh, young men don't last very long because they're often killed by their own gang because they are so dangerous and so reckless that they're a danger to the group. Yeah, that reminds me of what I think is really the most chilling line ever by Johnny Cash, where he sings, I shot a man just to watch him die, that there is a, a pleasure in the act of killing another. I think, that's, uh, I think that's right, but I think it's really important to not focus the public policy conversation on that exceedingly small number of people. Sure, fair enough. Because I think that, you know, this is a subject that really lends itself to uh, sort of sensationalist types of narratives. And it's just sure. important to understand that, yes, there is a small number of people out there who are, uh, you know, deeply disturbed and, and, and need to be separated from society. But that is not, uh, that is not this, the situation for the vast majority of people, even those who are involved in violence. Yeah, no, f fair enough. I mean, I'm very much not seeking to demonize here, but to move, as I think your book certainly is, to what the solutions are. Let's move to the, the next category, beyond people to places. Uh, what can you say on that front? Well, you know, just as uh, in order to maximize the opportunities for behavior change, you need both a set of positive and negative incentives for people uh, you need the same set of positive and negative incentives, push and pull factors, uh, you know, punishments and rewards uh, in places. And it's important for people to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about places. We're not talking about neighborhoods. I live in Boston. Uh, we're not talking about uh, Roxbury or Mattapan or Dorchester, which are neighborhoods where uh, that have especially high rates of, of gun violence. We're talking about micro locations known as hotspots, a very distinct location, a particular liquor store, a particular corner, a particular housing project, 
you know, nothing more than three to five blocks uh, in, in size. And that is where violence concentrates. And so one of the th- when we think of a neighborhood as, quote unquote, dangerous, that's often a neighborhood that has one or more hotspots. But many parts of that neighborhood are not violent. And that's why it's so important not to stigmatize entire neighborhoods or entire groups of people with this label of violence and to recognize how concentrated it really is. But back to what you do with uh, these hot spots. In order to address these hot stop hot spots, you need a set of balanced incentives. So yes, you need um, you know greater attention through things like hot spots policing or uh, you know targeted firearms patrols to in, to ensure that people know that um, you know carrying guns in this in this particular area is going to get a lot of attention and you may be and. And, you know, you may be subject to arrest if you do that. However, we can't just police these neighborhoods. We also have to invest in them. And so we need to think about ways to, uh, after we've temporarily reduced uh, shootings and killings through uh, proactive policing, to then change the nature of the hotspots itself through investment. And that's through things like uh, urban cleaning and greening, uh, meaning the sort of remediation of abandoned buildings and, uh, and, you know, uh, and lots. Um, it's also through, uh, other forms of investment in order to, uh, change the, 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 the physical and other, uh, and other aspects of it. And it's also through, also through community building. I think one of the things that we often focus on is sort of in, and we should probably talk more about this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will later is that we focus on sort of, uh, you know, reconciliation between government and communities, between cops and, uh, and residents um, in the broadest possible sense. But in order for violence reduction, that really needs to be done at the block level. So you need police officers in a particular precinct to get along with, you know, residents of a particular affordable housing uh, uh, project. And they need to get along with the uh, businesses that are right there. And that is the partnership level that, that we need, um, not sort of a massive kumbaya mo- mo- moment, which unfortunately may be some time in coming. Sure. You, you mentioned in the book uh, that citizen patrols, on the other hand, because I mean, I understand the focus on the community and getting it down to the, the grassroots to interject that term. But you said the can. If I heard you right in in the book, the citizen patrols don't really work as well as one might hope. Is that that's right? Okay. I, I think it's very important for people to understand that uh, while many people today are very interested in sort of community based efforts to prevent violence, and it's extremely important to have the participation of the community in violence reduction. It is extremely unreasonable, and I would argue deeply unfair, to ask a, a community to police itself. And, uh, and, and their history shows that it's not likely to happen. And so rather than thinking about the community taking on the functions of the state, it's about the community being fully consulted and fully participating um, in that uh, governmental function. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I believe, and I think that the research is somewhat incontrovertible that we need police, but we need those police to protect and serve, not rule. Okay. And the third piece of this was the things or the behavior based, uh, situations based strategies. What can you say on that front? Right. So this is, this is my way of framing the, the larger debates about sort of uh, guns, um, gangs, and drugs, uh, sure. that people talk a lot about, but that we haven't to date um, crafted particularly constructive public policy solutions for. And so, and the reason for that is because we haven't really focused on the nexus between those things and actual criminal and violent activity. And so my framing is instead of thinking about these things as objects, think about them 
as behaviors or verbs. So don't think about guns. Think about gun carrying or more specifically illegal gun carrying. Don't think about gangs. Think about violent gang rivalries. Don't think about drugs. Think about violent drug dealing. And that way you can tie those behaviors into the people and places who are at the highest risk for violence. So then you're thinking about not all guns, but illegal gun carrying among the highest risk individuals in the highest risk places. You're not thinking about anyone who might get a tattoo or, you know, say something on social media that says that they're involved in a gang. You're looking at the people who are violently involved in gang disputes in the high, uh, who are at the highest risk for violence in the highest areas. And the same thing for drugs. And all of a sudden, what you see is that this extraordinarily complex, incredibly persistent social phenomenon starts to become solvable. You start to say, okay, in my city, I have about 350 young men who I need to engage relentlessly, both with a set of positive and negative incentives. And I have a few dozen micro locations that I need to turn around. And if I can just, and I need to focus on two or three key behaviors in that place. Don't let people in, don't let those people in those places carry illegal weapons. Don't let them engage in these violent group activities and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden this complex problem starts to become solvable. Yeah. And I think that's the important things for for listeners, that this is evidence-based. So we're not just talking about political rhetoric, but we're, or, you know, chastising, stigmatizing. We're trying to get down to what works based on studies, evidence, observations, things that are concrete and making it concrete then allows you to go after what, you know, is the best use of resources and time and effort to pinpoint what can move this forward. That does bring me, of course, because you've had a lot of experience in, in government and, and, and at least on the, the fringes, the edges of pol- policy and politics and how they intersect. What is the biggest challenge to getting cities, states, whatever the unit we're talking about here of government to ad- adopt the methods you're talking about? What's that biggest challenge you would say you've faced? Well, I think that um, it's always been a problem. Uh, but right now, uh, post George Floyd and all of the unrest that has followed, uh, there is a toxic relationship, uh, between police, uh, and communities. And I think that, uh, I think that it is, it is possibly never been harder to have a reasonable conversation about how police and communities interact with one another, particularly in solving one of the most important issues. And it's very important for people to understand that in poor communities of color, uh, people feel, and there's been lots of surveys to show this, and I have spent many, many hours across dozens of cities and dozens of communities uh, speaking directly with people about this. People feel over-policed and under-policed. They feel hassled. They feel excessively stopped and searched and arrested and incarcerated for things that they, uh, that are often seen as, as, as trivial and could be handled through other means. But they also see enormous impunity for the most serious offenses. In many of the most violent cities across America, there are homicide clearance rates of 30, 20, even 15%. And so it's important for people to understand that if you really care about these communities, you have to recognize that they are be- both being overserved by our criminal justice system and underserved at the same time. It's a complex challenge, and it's exceedingly hard to break through and talk about that in a sensible way right now. Well, and I happen to be based here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the site of the George Floyd killing. I live actually about two miles from where that happened. Uh, And it's interesting what you just said, because, in fact, there were some people who very much wanted the police to be defunded and move away. And that's what the Minneapolis City Council, for instance, has talked about. But the largest portion of the black community in the Twin Cities, probably in North Minneapolis, 
And they very specifically said just what you're saying here, that uh, they feel certainly overserved in some uh, unfortunate ways, but they also very definitely feel underserved. And so defunding the police was actually about the last thing they wanted. They just wanted a much better way of moving this conversation forward. Um, I, I assume you've had similar conversations and found that to be true elsewhere. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think the vast majority of people living in dangerous communities uh, want the right police. Uh, they don't want less police. Uh, but there's also some uh, emerging research showing uh, coming out that really shows that uh, the biggest gen- the, the biggest sort of uh, gap in political opinion. Uh, here is not across race when it comes to defunding the police. It's actually by age and yeah. that, uh, and that, you know, um, older middle-aged, uh, and, you know, um, uh, and adult, um, African-Americans living in these communities, uh, are much more pro law enforcement or not pro law enforcement, but believe in the role of law enforcement versus, uh, younger, far more liberal, um, um, uh, people of color living in those same neighborhoods. And so, you know, the neighborhoods themselves uh, don't agree necessarily on the, on the solutions. Sure. Uh, now, of course, it's true that older people tend to vote more, so the politicians are going to listen to them. I want to go back to a comment you made almost in your opening remarks that everybody has and needs to have a stake in this conversation. One of the important books I read within the last couple of years is American Apartheid, and just how separate we still live, including absolutely in northern cities where you know the rate of de facto apartheid in terms of neighborhoods and integration, we're, we're talking upwards of 80, even 90 percent in some cases of separation of the races. What do you see as the kinds of messaging, the ways of reaching out that are going to make everyone realize that they do in some non-kumbaya sort of way, but take this seriously and try to find a collective solution as opposed to stigmatize? Well, I think there's an appeal to self-interest, which is that, uh, you know, um, which is a sort of more cold calculating uh, uh, approach, but it does move some people, which is that uh, like it or not, even if you are not directly affected by gun violence, you are paying for it. And uh, that if you would and that if you would invest in evidence based strategies, uh, you could spend a little uh, uh, money and have a return on investment of 10, 20, 50 to one. Um, And the reason is, again, going back to that 10 million dollar figure. Homicides are just so expensive that if uh, and so tragic that if you can avoid even just a few of them, um, the strategies that you use to do that pay for themselves many times over. And then the next, uh, the next uh, strategy is really one I think is a really sort of a call to sort of patriotic duty, which is that, uh, you know, oftentimes these homicides are happening only a few miles away from a quote unquote safe neighborhood. And, you know, we have to have a broader notion of citizenship. Uh, we have to have a broader notion of what it means to share, you know, uh, share the same city or same state or same country. And to say that like whatever our differences are, and you know, you may be conservative, you might be progressive, you might have a view, an expansive view of the federal government, or you might have a limited view of the federal government. Whatever your your whatever those differences of opinion, we should all be able to come together and say that the most disadvantaged and disenfranchised people in our in our society don't deserve to die at the wrong end of a gun. And I think that that's some sort of basic level of decency that we should be able to maintain. No, no, I, I would very much agree. Part of my sensitivity to this issue is I worked in downtown Newark, New Jersey, for about three and a half years in my career. And so many people when I was living in New Jersey just wanted to think the the cities was the city's problem. And, you know, most of the cities in New Jersey, historic cities do struggle. Uh, but uh, very often others in the state just kind of want to dismiss it as 
not their problem. We're going to run out of time in a little bit, but I have one other question. It does involve the police, but it may not involve uh, urban violence in the way we've been discussing it today. Um, probably with the news about what just happened in Michigan and the governor and the arrests made there, uh, I think I'm not alone in having some concerns about right-wing militias. But I also have a concern about the degree to which the police, at least I've seen some disturbing reports that the police have uh, much greater sympathies for these right-wing militias than I might hope for. To what extent am I being paranoid here and to what extent is there a, a real issue here? I think that it's important not to sort of engage in, um, in fear-mongering. I think that we, uh, we unfortunately uh, have a commander-in-chief who is pretty relentlessly engaging in divisive fear mongering. And I don't think that those of us who, uh, who want that commander in chief replaced, and that, that includes me, uh, should respond in kind. Uh, I think that this is something that if true is deeply disturbing and deserves very thorough investigation and research and where it exists, we need to root it out. But I think speculating uh, about the sympathies of people without evidence, particularly on a subject like this, is probably dangerous. No, no, fair enough. I, I mean, I think the news reports I, you know, in mentioning or in- indirectly citing were very specific in location. I-, I won't name which states or communities, but there there were more than one of these reports. But um, I think we'll have to leave it at that for today. I want to thank you, Thomas, very much for your time and for being a guest on Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. This has been episode number 24, How to Promote Peace in the Streets, with my guest, Thomas Apt. He is the author of Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. To check out other episodes of this podcast, please visit my company's website at www.sensorylogic.com. If you've got a follow-up question for Thomas, you can email it to me at dhill at sensorylogic.com. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give it a rating or review on iTunes. Finally, I like to conclude every episode with an appropriate epigram. As we've been talking about empathy and compassion and trying to deal with the terrible legacy and consequences of violence, I'll end with this quote from Susan Sontag. She said, to paraphrase several sages, Nobody can think and hit somebody at the same time. Until next time, be kind and stay safe. Mm